Good morning, Mr. Dennett. Hello. Hello. Uh, am I coming out clear? Yeah, very clear. Okay, so uh, like I like I said, thank you so much for participating in this benefit webathon that we're doing for the relief effort uh, that's ongoing right now. And so let's get to it so that we can talk about many things. Um, our organization is a free thought organization. And one of the things that keeps coming up in our discussions is um, whether a free thinker or a skeptic or someone who claims to be a critical thinker necessarily has to be an atheist or a materialist. Like, can they be intellectually honest and maintain a theist uh, position? Well, I suppose it's, it must be possible in some regard because I, I know a lot of people who are very intelligent and very sincere and intellectually honest in every way, in every other regard, and they somehow manage to uh, 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 at least profess uh, some theistic beliefs. I always have my doubts about uh, how much advantage they're taking of a sort of metaphorical interpretation of what they say. Uh, I often suspect that they're uh, deceiving themselves, uh, but it seems to be a rather uh, mild form of self-deception, if that's what it is. And maybe we should just give them the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, I don't know how you do it, but <laughs> apparently it's possible. <laughs> so it's a, you think it's kind of a belief in, a, in belief, as you have mentioned several you know, times? Um, well, it certainly is belief in belief. That is to say, uh, uh, for one reason or another, they've decided that believing in God is a really good thing. It's something they aspire to. And if you aspire to something... Uh, sometimes it helps to claim you, you've already achieved it. Um, as the Alcoholics Anonymous slogan would have it, fake it till you make it. And uh, um, that sounds a little crass, but when it works, it works. <laughs> and, <Thank you>. uh, <laughs> and speaking of that, of course there are people who actually say that they believe, but they actually they do not. Like you did a 2010 study on, on this, on preachers who are still uh, preachers, but who are no longer believers. Like, um, can you tell us about the findings that you have had from that study? Well, yes. In fact, we're just now wrapping up the second phase as a book, which should be out before Christmas. Great. Well, I, I look forward to reading that. Can you give us some spoilers? Of course, we'll get your book when it's out. Uh, the connection is uh, it's back but I, I can't oh there's a problem with the call hold on while we try to get the call back um, he okay sorry about that our call was dropped for some technical reason yeah okay now well, let's see so I guess we're back now so can you give us some spoilers about your upcoming book well, we've got, we've got several dozen more preachers uh, on, uh, that Linda's interviewed. They have different stories. And we've also extended it a bit to talk with, um, for instance, seminary professors who uh, teach the students, because a lot of the uh, dynamic of falling out of faith uh, and becoming a, uh, a, a non-believing preacher really get started in seminary. And uh, I think it's it's a very moving book, actually, and fascinating. There's so many different ways that people find themselves uh, drifting imperceptibly, always with good intentions, into a real situation where they're stuck in the pulpit uh, with, a, with a no longer believing yeah, I, I'm sure their stories are quite fascinating. I've read about people like Dan Barker for, or John Loftus who have lost their faith mm -hmm. and became kind of a, they, they've now become kind of preachers for the other side, like uh, right, yeah. champions of uh, atheism and non-belief. Uh, can you tell us, uh, of course, there's a trend of atheist churches. Uh, have you yeah. heard of that? What do you think of that new uh, trend that's going on? Well, um I guess I applaud the idea, but I, I doubt if it's going to work. Um, 
uh, I think we do have a need, a real pressing need, um, especially in the United States, for um, good alternatives, good institutional community alternatives to churches without the without the supernaturalism, without the irrationalism, just good community spirited groups, which is what churches have been very often in the past. And people that want to form into groups of that sort are wise to adopt as many of the design features of religion as they can bear in some regards. Because those are tested, time tested Design elements that that have 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 proven their worth over the centuries. So music, uh, 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 unison declaration. Don't call it prayer, but 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 saying a pledge in unison, uh, standing, swaying, uh, gets the gets the heart pumping a little bit. These are all these are all good things, and if you can. Enlist them. I don't see why you can't, really. I mean, uh, we have ceremonies, we have weddings and, and funerals and and uh, uh, commencement ceremonies, graduation ceremonies that that work as as rituals. I think ritual is a, a perfectly fine idea. The trick is that a lot of people that you want in these organizations are really averse to rituals. Yeah, I, I have a similar experience here. Whenever you mention anything that's uh, vaguely or remotely like the, the church, like a, free thinkers would be uh, against it. And, of course, there are people who, who think that there's nothing about religion that you can use. Like these are the self-professed militant atheists, or sometimes they call themselves anti-theists even. And there has recently been a backlash against this kind of militant or more like aggressive kind of atheism. And um, do you think that that kind of way of promoting skepticism has already run its course, that, that it's maybe time for a more compassionate and friendly kind of skepticism? Um, it may be, but I tend to think we're still in a period when uh, you want to have different strokes for different folks. There's lots of, there's some people that need that pail of cold water in the face that um, a, a militant atheism offers. And um, we want to make sure that we, we uh, 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 address the religious people on sort of all, all fronts and all types. But actually, yes, I've been saying recently that um, I think that the, the corner has been turned and that we should take, seri take seriously the fact that it really hurts to give up your religion. Um, and if you see your children falling away from the traditions you grew up with, and, and uh, this is something that has meant a lot to you all your life, this is a very painful period, and we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that that we will be uh, 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 liked by the by people for being the the, uh, the bearers of this bad news that their religion is crumbling. And so, I think compassion is is called for. Yes. Definitely. And um, speaking of a change of approach or a more compassionate approach, the new Catholic, uh, the Roman Catholic Pope has been getting a lot of positive press, even from skeptics, even from atheists or people who are uh, really very critical of, uh, of organized religion. What do you think of this guy? Uh, well, the Machiavellian answer is, uh, uh, was given in effect by Richard Dawkins, who, when asked some uh, a year or two ago whether he thought Ratzinger should resign, he said he hoped not, because he thought that a rigid uh, conservative like that was just the man to bring the church to its knees. <laughs> so, in, in one regard, uh, uh, we might rather wish to have uh, a more unbending and uh, uh, unlovable hope because it would continue to uh, 
drive people away from the Catholic Church. Uh, Francis is obviously deeply intent on, on preventing that from happening and bringing the, the, uh, uh, the wanderers back into the, into the church uh, and probably having some significant success. Although it's very interesting to see that the uh, church hierarchy is getting very, very resistant to this. Uh, there's been a lot of quite surprisingly public uh, uh, backlash uh, against the new pope, which must be uh, quite something for him to contemplate. Yes, and um, in our group, of course, uh, there are still people who uh, are Catholics, and yes. they, are, they are progressive Catholics, which is why they're part of a free-thinking organization. And they, they are hoping that that Pope Francis is the person to finally usher in progressive change into the Catholic Church. Like, um, with your experience and knowing the culture, the cultural basis that the Catholic Church is founded on, do you think that there is still hope for uh, meaningful change in the Catholic Church, or do you think that the changes that will happen will mostly be just cosmetic? Um, I think that what's likely to happen is that church changes cosmetically too slowly, too slowly to preserve itself. I think right now we're in a very chaotic period where all religions are going to have to change dramatically or go under. They're going to go extinct. And this is, they can go extinct very fast. Um, uh, there's, there's remarkably little momentum, I think, in any church, and in spite of the fact that it has a tremendous uh, portfolio of money and thousands and thousands of churches and all of these rituals and offices, uh, if people start abandoning the church, it can fall apart very fast. And uh, I have said that I think the next religion is going to change more in the next 10 or 20 years than it's changed in the last century. And it's going to change more, in the, it did change more in the last century than it did in the last two millennia. And uh, the accelerated change brought about by the new transparency of information is really striking. And no church has yet figured out how to deal with that. Yes, uh, and um, like you, you mentioned that you think that religion will change in a very rapid way. Um, what do you think the direction is going to be? I read certain people speculate that in the future religions will probably go in the way of uh, humanism, either religious humanism or secular humanism. So do you think that that is correct? Well, it's hard to say. Let's look at some of the candidates. Um, in the United States, um, the mega churches, which are actually some of them having troubles now, They've been drawing people away from the uh, uh, evangelical and fundamentalist churches into these glittering new megachurches. And their, their recipe seems to be, they're basically country clubs <laughs> and daycare centers. They have, they have yoga classes and lots of parking and, and daycare and a swimming pool and uh, trips uh, around the world uh, and they have services with uh, uh, lots of, uh, you know, sort of soft rock music. And they, they go out of their way to avoid being very churchy. Uh, and, and they are doctrinally, uh, almost comically uh, lax. Basically, uh, 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 the story is uh, that as long as you are one with Jesus one with Jesus, then whatever you believe is right. But what does that mean? Well, whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> so, so. Um, so, yeah, religions, of course, aren't created equal. Um, some have survived better than others. And, of course, that says nothing about how ethical or how good of a religion it is. Yeah. But yeah. Um, as, a, as a humanist or as a, as a skeptic, of all the religions that you have surveyed, what do you think is the most ethical? And one of, like, if there were only a few or even just one religion remaining, what would you prefer it to be? Well, well, that's a hard one, actually. 
because in part through this the study that Linda Lascola and I have done, I've come to appreciate more the costs, the personal costs to the clergy of the ultra-liberal religions where the clergy are basically required to to speak in metaphors but not admit it. Because um, there's a sort of double speak there. The old folks in the church hear the preacher and they think the preacher is speaking literally. Uh, the young folks understand that this is all metaphor and this creates a sort of systematic dishonesty within the church that that can be smothered and for generations in a way but it, uh, but uh, this is uh, one of the real difficulties that churches face whereas the 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 literal churches the the uh, conservative churches uh, uh, they they mean what they say and and when somebody falls away from that boy they they fall hard and so I I am ethical ethical um, well you know the Unitarians uh, are. Uh, uh, a pretty well established uh, organization uh, doesn't appeal to everybody but they certainly are, are uh, ethics and doing good works is right up at the top of their list and I, I find that attractive and aside from you know the Unitarians people who lose uh, religion they tend to um, at least in my experience, they tend to go through this phase where they say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Um, what yeah. is your take on this? Um, my take on it is uh, uh, benign neglect, uh, tolerance. Uh, I'm not going to hound somebody who says that. I don't think they know what they mean by spiritual, but but they, they're well-meaning. They think they mean something good. And uh, probably they do. They mean that they are serious about making their life mean something, mean something ethically. If that's what they mean, then I'm all for spirituality. But um, for some of them, it just means uh, uh, adopting a sort of gullible uh, New Age uh enthusiasm for almost anything that comes along. Yes, and of course there are those who do not turn spiritual, who do not lose their religion, who actually cling to religion as hard as they can. And it's something that of course we appreciate in this country especially with uh, calamities uh, like with the typhoon Yolanda. Yes. And of course, in, statistically, in environments when there is poverty, when the, where there is existential insecurity, religion th tends to thrive. And and do you think that it's right for for skeptics to criticize uh, that kind of thinking or no. that culture in a time like this? Or when is the right time? Or is there such a thing as yes. the right time? Very very important point. Yes, the the uh, the statistics on this are just overpowering. Uh, it's precisely where people are worst off, where they are most insecure, where poverty reigns, where in, in, in states that are on the edge of being failed states, this is where religion thrives. And it thrives, and one can see, I think, exactly why it thrives. People are desperate, and they need something to cling to, and it's their, it's their source of hope. And as soon as times get better, they start wandering away from the church. This is something that that Calvin uh, uh, noted, <laughs> he realized he had a sort of paradox. The very, the very Calvinistic virtues that he was teaching um, in Switzerland, uh, when they succeeded, the the parishioners became less interested in their church. They didn't have to. They didn't have to be as dependent on the church. And I think that we. For the same reason that we, uh, well, I would never advise somebody to 
a skeptic to try to talk a person in the last days of their life, you know, talk them out of their religion. That's just cruel. Um, uh, th their, their fantasy may help them, and it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, and if uh, right now, in, in the terrible straits that people are in in the Philippines, I think anything that encourages them to to help the person next to them and not think of the person next to them as competing for that last scrap of food or, or, or that last bit of shelter, but instead anything that will encourage uh, mutual aid and cooperation and and a sense of hope is don't don't extinguish that. Let it let it go. Um, uh, we can. We can reflect once people are well fed and housed. We can reflect on what it all means, uh, but not not right now. Not till we've got them in better shape. So it's it's one thing to say that we shouldn't, you know, criticize religion so much because people need it. You know, um, an, another kind of thing that's happening here in this country right now is there is this anti-critical like. Uh, meme that that's going around that say that says something like you shouldn't be critical of the government you should you shouldn't be yeah. critical of of people trying to to help or trying to to even use blatant lies to inspire others uh, what do you think of this like what about the the critics who think that um, criticism is a valuable thing by itself and um, who are afraid that being uncritical at this time will let those people who deserve criticism go? I think this is actually a tough question. I think it's a tough issue. Um, um, suppose that you were living in a state that was on the edge of being a failed state, about to, about to collapse into economic chaos, and political chaos. And suppose that you knew some facts about the government, which if you wrote about them in your newspaper, would pretty well guarantee the, the collapse of the state. Uh, meanwhile, let's suppose there are investors that are just about ready to invest in improvements, and there's a whole lot of help right in the offing, but it will evaporate overnight if you if you blow the whistle. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I think we can tell that story, put the details in such a way that one has to think very hard about whether, you know, uh, how much, uh, how much uh, buttoning my lip, how much silence can I justify if that silence will or might preserve and improve a situation. But, of course, the trouble is that uh, it's almost impossible to make those judgments in, a, in an informed way. You're taking a chance. And there's always going to be scoundrels who will leap into that silence and take advantage of it. So uh, it's a hard one. Uh, but you do have to recognize that you might be risking uh, um, the, just the utter collapse. And then sometimes you might say, well, utter collapse is better. Uh, utter collapse with truth is better than hanging on by our fingernails with lies. Uh, that may be true, but, but once a state fails, it's very, very hard to put it back in order. We, we've seen this around the world. When you get a failed state, it just seems that just, just about impossible to recover any sense of security and trust in the country. I like to talk more about the, the idea of that, that failed state, but, but first let's talk about the cultural evolution. Uh, you mentioned the idea of cultural fleas, like these memes that are passed on but aren't necessarily yeah. beneficial. Like, yeah. um, do you think that religion is a uh, is a cultural flea, or um, what are cultural fleas that you that you think uh, are uh, that P view in particular? Well, um, 
Yes, I view culture as containing a lot of elements, not all cultural elements to this way, that are that are basically um, well perceived as like symbiotic creatures. They they are. They're like they're like like fleas and mice and rats and cockroaches. They have evolved to thrive in human company, but they don't do us any good. But they're too hard to eradicate. And and uh, uh, um, uh, malicious gossip, um, um, uh, crazy folk beliefs that are harmful, uh, racist attitudes, um, uh, um, hazing traditions in organizations where the initiation rites are obscene and cruel and demeaning. Uh, there's a few examples right there of, uh, and some religious practices certainly that uh, don't do anybody any good, but they're very good at prolonging themselves. So they survive like the common cold because they can. Yeah. So uh, of course you're talking about you know these cultural these these memes, right? But um, uh-huh. um, memes are used in a different sense. Uh, more people are familiar with. Internet memes and the Philippines uh, being the often called the social media capital of capital of the world. We get a lot mm-hmm. of things in social media such as memes and and all of these. What what do you think of this uh, this idea of social media? Like, um, do you think that it's something that will dramatically change the the society or culture for the better, or is it something that that could be uh, could go both ways? It could go both ways. Um, first of all, let me say a word about about um, um, internet memes and software memes. Um, um, the word has been appropriated. Memes is a, is not, in a way, a bad term for them. But since these are clearly intelligently designed, I mean, the people trying very hard to make a viral video or to make a viral s- slogan, um, so that the, the the source of these is not the mimetic source that Dawkins was talking about. This is not mindless, bottom-up Darwinian evolution. This is intelligent design of means, which is fine. We're intelligent designers. <laughs> but, and we exist. But then, you know, we exist. We're, we're not that intelligent, but we're much more intelligent than, than in the early days of cultural evolution. So if we talk about those as memes, then we have to recognize that we've abandoned what is perhaps their defining feature, which is that, that, that they are uh, created and designed and improved by differential selection, not by clever designers. Um, but then, what about social media, and what kind of changes is that going to achieve? I think some good and some bad. Um, I think that the fact that social media have expanded our world so that we have, as, as it were, the whole world is my village, and I can, uh, I can, uh, uh, geographic distance is no barrier anymore. Uh, that has many positive uh, uh, sides, but it also has a negative one. That is, we don't know our neighbors. Mm. And we have people who are uh, uh, turning their back on their neighborhoods and devoting themselves to living in cyberspace. And I think that's uh, not only unfortunate, I think it's actually very dangerous. Uh, I think that if, for instance, the Internet were to collapse, as it could, as it could, um, people would be have become so dependent on it that they would panic. And, and this would be a very nasty world. That would be a very nasty thing. I can certainly agree that people would panic if the Internet collapsed. So um, you mentioned the, uh, intelligent design and... I am very thankful that creationism is not such a problem in this country. However, um, dogmatism is, and it's what's kept uh, progress in the in the social justice arena quite stalled. Like we have, for example, this uh, reproductive health bill, or it's now a law that cannot be implemented because of um, uh, of religious opposition. Now, this these religious people who oppose uh, this uh, contraceptive law. They've wisened up, they've evolved somehow, and they're now using science 
on their side. They're they're citing these supposed um, scientific experts who who say, um, hey, we have just enough, just as much science and evidence and logic on our side. Now it becomes you know a battle of um, who has the better scientist uh, who to cite. So well, what do you think about this problem? <laughs> First of all, I can't. I want to know who on earth are the scientists that that are on the other side. I mean. And what are their credentials? Are there any of them that have uh, 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 important posts in any scientific laboratory or institution? Yeah, um, they do not, actually. And the, the problem is, like, um, the scientific literacy here is not so high. So yeah. there, there really needs to be some more education on, you know, how to, to be sure of your scientific sources. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is uh, one of the... Um, uh, side effects, one of the byproducts of the sort of democratization of the of the communication world, which which is unfortunate, um, uh, because uh, there was a certain amount of quality control in the sort of somewhat uh, authoritarian, somewhat bureaucratic, the sort of pecking order that you know the scientists. Well, if you're if you're a scientist at, at MIT or Caltech or Oxford, that's one thing. And if you're a scientist at at um, East Podunk Junior College, it's something else. But um, the opinions of the of the least educated, least accomplished scientists can now be trumpeted just as widely as the opinions of uh, the uh, very best experts in the field. That's a real problem. Yeah, and um, you, you of course agree that critical thinking is a very important thing to have. You wrote a book, uh, Intuition Pumps. Um, h- how do you think we can increase the value put on critical thinking in such a conservative and religious culture such as ours? Good question. I, I don't have any uh, um, fast recipes. I, I've got a few uh, ideas I would think that um, it might be possible to create little dramas uh, and what uh, medium or form they would take, I don't know, where uh, uh, there's a solution to a problem which requires some critical thinking in a surprising way. And uh, 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 the hero uh, is... And maybe the whole audience can see, oh, just if you just put on your skeptical glasses, you'll see what you have to do to get out of this problem. And, and it, might, it might enliven the uh, appreciation of critical thinking if you had some, say, children who were uh, uh, at first uh, teased or belittled for their being skeptics and then they save the day in one way or another. That might help. Yeah. Um, a- another uh, idea or thinking, another problem that has been brought up by this whole um, weather disaster that happened in the Philippines mm-hmm. is how um, capitalism has somehow caused uh, or in- a- accelerated global warming. And um, a lot of people are you know, thinking that maybe we should challenge the idea of capitalism. People, Celebrities like Russell Brand have even you know, gone viral with that speech that he did. Like, what do you think about this, about how capitalism can somehow um, evolve into something quite different? Well, I haven't heard about Russell Brand's viral speech. I'm sort of curious. It seems to me he's a rather unlikely spokesman for that view, considering (laughs) what capitalism has brought to him. But uh, never mind that. Um, he might have had a, a valuable change of heart. He is an intelligent man in many regards. Um, uh, I think that uh, we really did learn in the late 20th century that um, uh, uh, planned economies are, it just doesn't work. And it doesn't work for rather deep reasons. And so some sort of capitalism, tempered and 
modified and partially controlled is is really I think uh, you got to have it. And for instance, let's take seriously the wonderful, wonderful effects of microfinancing in the third world. Uh, this is a great uh, movement which bringing microfinancing to poor people around the world and mainly to women. Uh, and of course that's capitalism. Yeah. But it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, Improving the lot of women, it's improving the, the, the health and safety and, and welfare of people all over the world. Uh, the thing is to prevent the excesses of capitalism. And that is a scary thing because the multinational corporations are now, uh, in some regards, operating almost with impunity. That is, states are having a hard time controlling them. And that's that's definitely worrying. Um, you used um, anarchy as an analogy for um, how the brain actually works. Um, and yeah. you said that, um, you, you speculated that, that the human creativity was possible because of that kind of organization. Now, I was yeah. wondering if you thought that translated into the real world, that if we had such a system it would greatly accelerate, you know, the kind of human society that we could have. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, the, the possibility of a real-world um, application of the analogy that you used for the brain? Oh, I think, I think that's actually pretty obvious. If you look at very rigidly, hierarchically controlled societies, creativity is hard to find. <laughs> I mean, the... the, the um, uh, point that tempers that is that uh, I think all really creative artists recognize that um, constraints are important for creativity. Uh, uh, a lot of the greatest art, for instance, was done under commission by a church or a state where a very specific artistic task, a theme, this is for the glorification of the king, or this is to commemorate the battle and such. And uh, these were often not particularly inspiring commissions. Uh, but the fact that they had to, the artists had to work within that framework. They had to, they had to come up with something wonderful uh, with that inside that straitjacket, led to some of the greatest strokes of creativity uh, ever. So constraint is not a bad thing for creativity. It's just too much constraint, which is the problem. Okay, and, and of course, um, I know that uh, anarchy is something that um, this group of people would not want to happen. Um, I'm talking about objectivists, um, the Ayn Rand, you know, <laughs> libertarian kind of objectivists. Uh, and um, in, in our group, um, I in particular personally have... Um, quite some difficulty like conversing or discussing or debating with two kinds of uh, people, um, objectivists and postmodernists. So, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're on opposite sides of the spectrum. Yes. One, one is so certain, the other says there can be no certainty whatsoever. Yes. Um, what's <laughs> your, your take on this? <laughs> I think the right idea is to put them all in a room and let them fight it out. We can go <laughs> do something important. <laughs> They deserve each other. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I'll see if that can be arranged. Yeah, let's work for it. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but as philosophies, like how valid do you think those stances actually are? Um, Not at all. I think they're, I think they're threadbare and, and, and incoherent. And, and actually socially pernicious. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, thank you for that. That, uh, that made me laugh uh, and happy inside. So um, l one last question from me before I bring the discussion to the wider audience online and in this room. Um, recently, I've read like a, another skeptical writer, Guy Harrison. He wrote about how skepticism... Like should be a sort of social advocacy. Like he said that, um, um, you know, he it's kind of rem reminds me of the work of uh, 
William Clifford in Ethics of Belief when, when he said that we have an ethical duty to spread skepticism because if people aren't mm-hmm. skeptical, it's not good for society. So do you mm-hmm. think that people like us who have this uh, critical thinking bent, uh, free thinkers of all sorts, have an ethical responsibility to let others, uh, uh, I mean to teach others or influence others to think skeptically as well? And um, should... Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, of course. That's, that, I think that's uh, the, one of our primary obligations. Absolutely. And yeah... Uh, of course, uh, a lot of um, atheists, you know, they start out just, you know, being pissed off at uh, at religion. You know, they, they feel that they've been duped. But I feel personally that, that they have to go beyond that and to look to um, social justice causes. Do you agree with, with this kind of, uh, kind of thinking? Well, I certainly think that what free thinking groups, humanist, atheists, what all these groups should do is not just sit around bad-mouthing religion, but do good works. And, um, for instance, what you're doing right now is exactly the right thing to be doing because you're, you're, you're helping your fellow citizens in a time of crisis. You're dropping everything and coming to their aid, and you're doing it under the banner of free thought. And I think it's very important that that we do that because uh, my own impression of how people in the United States, particularly say in the Bible Belt, the reason that the churches are so strong there is that young people looking around and thinking they want to be good, they want to have good lives, they they want to do good things. The only groups they see doing good things in organization are the churches. Yeah. So they figure that's the, they figure that's what they have to do to do to have a good life to be good, and we want to show no 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 we have the muscle we have the organization we have the team spirit we can do good things too.